I, uh, I had no idea a year ago. Can you believe it's only been a year? It's only been a year that I've known you guys. Hey, Sharona, good to see you. I've been enjoying hanging out with my friend Jarvis this weekend, and his wife is here. We've known each other over 20 years, and i uh, going to meet some of your cute kids after the service. So, But, uh, I, man, I had no idea a year ago when I came for the first time to CRC that God was going to give me a family, you know. And Apostle John and Apostle Judy, Pastor Mark, they are family to me. Uh, Al and just so so many of you. Violet back there. <clears throat> I've got some more of my family, family from Michigan here, Cody and Lindsay Cook that flew from Michigan to be with me, and I just love them. They were a part of my church during my uh, pastoring years, and they still are a huge part of our ministry. Lindsay just went to Israel with my wife, and so I'm just honored to be here, and I'm honored to bring the word to you. I have several prophetic words for people individually, but I'm going to give those to you at the end when we're at the altar. I'm going to call you at the altar, to the altar at the end, um, and I'm going to give those to you at, at that time. Does that sound okay? Because I really do want to give you the word, and um, I'm aware of the, of the time. And I want to say this. I would rather you hear from God than me any day, <laughs> any day. He has the words of life. His disciples said to him, you alone have the words of life. And in that worship, that was words of life for us. And, and I got a prophetic word. <laughs> that's like, that's amazing to me. Thank you so much, Mrs. Fram, for that word. I really appreciate that word that really touched my heart. And it was really a confirmation to me uh, of many things the Lord has spoken to me, many, many things the Lord has spoken to me, including new nations. I've been to something like 40 nations. I, I don't, I haven't counted uh, them, but I've been to something like 40 nations, and this year has been a year of new nations for me. I'm, I'll be in India in two weeks. Uh, I was in Russia in January, which was a new nation for me, and also uh, we were in Turkey, uh, where the original seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation, they are all in modern-day Turkey. The Lord is stirring me up to take a group of people, like a, a SWAT team of prayer warriors and intercessors and worshipers, to Turkey. That Turkey used to be the center of Christianity, you know, and it was known as, the, the center of it was known not as Istanbul, but as Constantinople. And Constantinople was the center of Christianity at that uh, time, the Byzant what's referred to as the Byzantine era, which is a lot more than I have time to get into. But it used to be really the, the center of Christianity, but now it's shifted to where it's 99% Muslim, 99% Muslim. Becky Fisher just came to our, our home church. How many know every prophet needs a home church? Can you say amen? So I have a home church. I have a home pastor. I pay my tithes. I love church. Can you say amen? I love I love the church. I believe in the local church. And so Becky Fisher was just with us, and she said it's 99% Muslim. I did not know that, and I was shocked to hear that. There was 1% Christians in that nation, the nation that all the original seven churches of Revelation, Philadelphia, Ephesus, Laodicea, all of that are mentioned there. They are physically, historically there. And so I have a heart. I, I've been stirred up by the Lord for a seven burning lamps tour of the original seven churches in Turkey, and not just to tour and learn, although, of course, I'm sure we will learn some archaeology, some history, some, you know, biblical literacy, all of that, but to pray and worship at each of those spots. Not all of them have a church still there, but at each of those historical spots and ask the Lord to mature the body in those areas that the churches of Revelation were addressed because it's not just to those churches. It was for the body of Christ, for this age and the earth that we are in. So I've been praying about that. But anyway, that was such a confirming word, uh, Mrs. Fram, and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And so today I want to share with you, I want to share with you about the new wineskin that God is releasing upon the earth. But the message title, if I had to give it a title, it would be You Can Transform Your World. You can transform your world. You are well able to transform your world. So write that down because I want you to remember that with just what Pastor Mark was saying, just what he was saying. And I, I was going to get up here and say, man, everybody should be sewing into this, but you did, so I don't have to even say it. I don't have to even say it. I was going to get up here and be like, leave that basket here. I want you to sew while I'm preaching, but you already did it, so good job. <laughs> Good job, because, man, we, we all need to be sown. We can't all sow the same amount, and it's not the amount that God looks at. But we all can sow something. Come on, we can all sow something. 
God's people ain't broke. Can you say amen? We're not broke. We're blessed. <laughs> so we can all sow something, and we need to sow into the harvest of the nations. It's so important. And so I want you to remember the word that he spoke, that you can transform your world when you are at Wawa, when you are at the restaurant, when you are at the grocery store, when you are walking down the street, when you see the person go into the liquor store or wherever they're going, instead of judging them, go share the gospel with them, go share the truth of the word of God with them, the, the event. Evangelist is not just a five-fold ministry. We are all to be doing the work of an evangelist. Paul said to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Timothy was an apostolic overseer. He was one of the leaders in the church of Ephesus. They called Ephesus historically the city church. There were so many people in this church. It was absolutely humongous. It was a huge task. It was a huge mission. That's why Paul said to Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you because of your youth. Part of the reason he said that was because because of the scope of what Timothy had been entrusted with. So Timothy, I don't believe personally, was a five-fold evangelist, but Paul said to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. And so that's true for all of us. You may not be a five-fold evangelist. We know the five-fold comes to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You all know that. Say amen. But not everybody's a five-fold evangelist, but everybody is to do the work of an evangelist, which is why I personally don't receive intercession as something special for a special group of people. We're all to be intercessors. We're all to be those that cry out. So there are some basic tenets of Christianity, basic tenets of the faith that we have marginalized and we have specialized. They are not to be marginalized. They are not to be specialized. We are all to carry out the work of the word of God. And part of that is sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a side note. But I want to talk about the new wine. I want to talk about the power that God has given you to transform your world and that you have a call for such a time as this in this hour that we are living in. This entire weekend, we've talked about the warrior watchman. We've talked about many things. The Lord has equipped us. The Lord has strengthened us. The Lord has encouraged us. I believe there's another drink for us from Holy Spirit today. I believe fresh oil is going to be poured out today. I believe prophetically Matthew 24 and Matthew 25 are going to mirror in a very real way the shaking and the testings of 2024 and 2025. And let me say this, if you don't remember anything else, Remember this, you will not stand in Matthew 24 shaking if you do not have the oil of intimacy of Matthew 25. And every parable that Jesus told in Matthew 25, they are not by happenstance. They were directly linked to Matthew 24, where Jesus gives 22 specific signs of the times, and he gives more information on the end times in that chapter than anywhere else in all of Scripture. It's his chief treatise, if you will, on the end times. Many, many theologians call it the Olivet discourse because it says that Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives and he taught his disciples from the Mount of Olives. So that's referred to as the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24 and 25, the mood seems different, but it is one teaching. It is one teaching. The signs of the times then are interpreted in the parables that Jesus gives. I don't have time to teach that. I have something else on my heart. But it's extremely important for us to understand that in the shaking that is here and is coming and I, you know, many people call me a prophet. The Lord has certainly given me prophetic revelation at, at seasons in my life. I'm in one of those seasons where I am not sleeping a whole lot because the Lord is waking me up. I'm hearing doors open and close in the spirit. I'm hearing keys jangling. I'm hearing pens writing. And some of it is good and some of it is ominous and makes my skin crawl. I'm hearing handshakes. I'm hearing conversations in hidden rooms and doors and politi politics offices. And I'm not released to share a lot of that. I can't give you the specifics of what the Lord is speaking, but let me tell you this. I don't want to be a false prophet, and I don't want to tickle your ears. There is more shaking coming. There is more shaking coming. That's not to scare you. We are going to arise and shine in the midst of the shaking. This will not be our, our, our time that we draw back. This will be our finest hour. It's our Isaiah 60, 1, 2, and 3 moment as the body of Christ that in the midst of the gross darkness that settles, the, the word in the Hebrew there, it means to sit on the people like a heavy weight sitting on the people. We are to arise and shine for our light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. And so do not fear the future. Do not fear the future. I can't overemphasize that enough. Many people are living in fear of the future. There's nothing wrong with wisdom, nothing wrong with putting a little more food aside or a little more money aside. Nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Don't misunderstand me. But don't do it from a perspective of fear. 
don't do it from a perspective of like, oh man, God's not going to provide for me. You know, I'm not going to be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And so I better put this aside. You know, your careful planning is not going to sustain you in that day. Jesus told the Pharisees, the kingdom doesn't come by your careful observation and your careful planning. The kingdom of God is within you and the kingdom of God is at hand. And so nothing wrong with wisdom, nothing wrong. Don't misunderstand me. Nothing wrong with any of that. But that is not what will sustain you. The Lord himself self will sustain you in this time. The Lord himself is still the one that multiplied the fish and loaves. The Lord himself is still the one that for the widow in the account of Elisha, the oil poured and poured and poured and poured and poured and did not stop. I believe in the gift of multiplication. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. But the Lord is going to provide for you and sustain you by his own hand, by his own might, by his own strength. Do not fear the future and do not fear the shaking. Stand in the shaking. Stand in the day of trouble. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand. Having done all to stand, having done everything, stand because it's the promise of God for you from the scripture. And so we are going to arise and shine. It's going to be our greatest hour. But we are in a season in the body of Christ. We are in a season in the earth of much transition. We are a transitional generation. You need to understand that. Part of the conflict, part of what is going on that we need to understand is that we are a transitional generation. And I want to give you a scripture here that can help inform you you in that, which is 2 Samuel 3 and verse 1. 2 Samuel 3 and verse 1, it says this, the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger while the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. We are in a season where we are transitioning from the house of Saul to the house of David. And Saul had the power, he had the palace, he had the prosperity, he had the army, he had all of that, but he had lost the anointing. David was in the cave, he was hiding, running for his life in the caves near En Gedi, which we'll go to, some of you are going with us to Israel in March. You will see the literal caves where Jesus hid from Saul in the waterfalls of En Gedi and all of that. But David was hiding for his life and he was being, you know, he was being persecuted and chased and suffering, but he had fresh oil. It's better to have fresh oil in a cave than to sit on a throne in a palace with money and an army. It's better to have fresh oil in this season than it is to be in the house of the wealthy and the rich or the powerful because God doesn't look upon that. He doesn't consider that. He considers, the Bible says, the humble and the broken. He considers, his heart looks upon those that tremble at his word. And so this is a season to realize we are transitioning from the house of Saul, which ultimately boils down to witchcraft because the, the Bible says rebellion is as witchcraft and Saul's issue was an issue of rebellion. There's a whole lot to that that I don't have time to get into. But right now, because of this transitional generation we are in, we are living in Amos 9-11 where the Bible says in Amos 9-11 that on that day, Robert Stern's, Bishop Stern's favorite phrase, on that day, say that day. I'm going to be like Bishop Stearns, one of my mentors, one of my beloved mentors with you this morning. I can't tell you how many times I heard him preach that message, and it never got old. I served him for 10 years of my life. I heard him preach Amos 9-11 probably three or 400 times throughout that time, and it never got old because it's a now season. So we are in that season where God is raising up the tabernacle of David, and the tabernacle of David is not just a place of worship and prayer and declaration and prayer. It is a legislative force in the earth that legislates and partners with heaven to set the times and seasons in the earth. The devil, the Bible says in the book of Daniel, seeks to change the times and seasons. He rages against the Most High. He rages against the people of God, and he seeks to change the times and seasons. But God works with his people in the earth as sons of Issachar, who understood the times and knew what to do, prophetic revelation and apostolic wisdom, the sons of Issachar, to set the times and seasons in the earth. For the Lord is sovereign over the affairs of men and over all of our days in the earth. So right now, it's all about new wine and new wineskins. New wine and new wineskins. Matthew 9, 14 to 17 says this. 
Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom, who wants to be a friend of the bridegroom? Man, I want to be a friend of the bridegroom. Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn? <clears throat> Forgive my voice this morning. I've been preaching or doing, I was one weekend officiating a wedding. So I've been doing something every single weekend and also in between for this entire month. And I've got a lot more travel before the end of the year. So forgive my voice. Uh, I'm not uh, about to cry or sick or anything like that. I'm just tired. My voice is tired. So, but can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. And then they will fast, which is why we fast. We fast. How many practice the discipline of fasting? And you can be honest, it's okay, no one's going to judge you. The discipline of fasting is probably the hardest spiritual discipline that I have given myself to. The hardest spiritual discipline. I've given myself so much to fasting that actually I started, uh, one time I was fasting for breakthrough for children who had cystic fibrosis. And I said, I said I'm not going to eat until they're healed. <laughs> I'm not eating until they're healed. So I got about to day 15. And I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was having heart palpitations. And my wife said, you know, was that your good desire, or was that really the word of the Lord? Go to the hospital. She's like, I'm not losing you. So I went to the hospital, and they suggested strongly, I'll put it that way, that I stop fasting. But the Lord heard my, my prayer anyway, and he did break through for these children. But, but the, the spiritual discipline of fasting, let's face it, nobody necessarily likes it. Okay, nobody's flesh is going to want to do it, but I cannot overemphasize the importance of fasting in the day and time that we live in. The Bible talks about some only coming out, demonic forces only coming out through the means of prayer and fasting. There are strong men over our nation. We talked about this in the school of the prophets. Get the CDs, not just mine, but Elizabeth's. Get the CDs, get equipped, get trained, because we talked about this. There are strong men over the nation of the USA that will not be dislodged or displaced. See, demons are cast out. Right? Demons are cast out. The, the Bible described Jesus casting them out with the, with the finger of God. Mark's going to do a lot of that. In Me there's a, I feel that there's a whole deliverance mantle that is you know, going to be upon you while you're in Mexico. It's going to be in your left hand for some reason. I don't know why. But there's, gonna, there's this deliverance mantle that is coming upon you. You're going to cast out demons by the finger of God. They're going to come out shrieking. They're going to come out. You're going to command them to shut up in the name of Jesus. And you will, you will literally see healing after healing after healing as you cast out the demons because the spirits of iniquity are working strong in the region that you're going to. And people think it's a physical issue. It's not a physical issue. It's a demon. And when you cast out that devil, they're going to get healed, says the Lord. So there's a specific anointing on your life. I just had to release that to my brother, Mark. Just say amen. The Lord's going to use him powerfully. But demons are cast out. Principalities and powers are displaced dislodged and it takes a corporate anointing to displace or dislodge powers and principalities and so that doesn't happen without prayer and fasting say prayer and fasting let's make that declaration prayer and fasting and so uh, verse 16 no one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse nor do they put new wine into old wineskins or else the wineskins break the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined but they put new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved from a historical perspective the reason that they put new wine into new wineskins is because new wineskins were flexible they were flexible. They would stretch and they would move because in the new wine, it hadn't fully fermented yet. So there was still gases that were being released from the new wine as it sat in the wineskin, as it sat in the heat, as it sat in the cool, wherever they had it, they had different purposes. But the wineskin, as these gases were released from the fermentation of the wine, that the wineskin would expand. And as the wineskin expanded, it would stretch and it would stretch and stretch and new wineskins were flexible for the stretching, for the ever-evolving, ever-changing condition of the wine, the new wine. See, the new wine, you can't ask for new wine from the Holy Ghost and be rigid. You can't ask for new wine from the Holy Ghost and expect it to be the same every single time. It's not the same every single time. It's ever-evolving. It's ever-expanding. It's ever-changing because it's new wine, and you need a new wineskin. You need something soft, pliable, humble, 
flexible for new wine. There is a purpose for the old wine, and there's a purpose for the old wineskin, which is why God said specifically in this, in this passage, he wants them both preserved, actually. So preserved means to save. There is goodness in the old wine. But the problem is, the Bible says, those that tasted the old wine, when they taste the new wine, they say the old is better. And so we can't say the old is better. We can't say Saul is better. We can't say the old thing, the old way, the way we've always done it is better. We've got to say, God, your way is better and sign up and position ourselves to be flexible, to be stretched in the new wine as God stretches us and uses us to transform our world. Okay, so a few things, five key indicators of this new wine, and I'm aware of the time, I really am, but I'm aware of the time. Five key indicators in this is number one, it is organic, it is not institutional. Organic, not institutional. And this is Acts chapter 2, which I'll read in a moment. You can write that down next to that point. Number two is it is fueled by genuine encounter. Fueled by genuine encounter. When Jacob wrestled with God, that was what we call a Christophany or a theophany. In other words, when Jesus showed up in the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament is all, Jesus is all throughout the Old Testament. And when God, when, you know, when Jacob said, I wrestled with God, I've seen God. I've seen the face of God. He called the place Peniel. He called the place Bethel, right? Because, because God showed up. That was Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. And so, Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. I will not let you go until I am changed. And see, that's the problem with some of us. The problem with some of us, we've been in a wrestle. We've been in a conflict. We've been in a fight. And we think that when the, the wrestle ends, we've gotten what we're supposed to get. But see, there's a purpose in the wrestle. And if you let go of the wrestle prematurely, if you let go of the test and the trial prematurely, you don't get the transformation that God wants to bring into your life. And so you've wrestled in vain. you struggled in vain. And it's been in vain because you haven't held on to see the purpose in the wrestle. When the wrestle comes we think well God is displeased with me God doesn't like me God you know God hates me because he's testing me in fact the Bible says God disciplines those that he loves and in fact the baptism of fire the word fire is the word in the Greek poor and what it means is the eternal flame it means fire but it also means testings and trials and challenges how many of us have ever been at the altar God baptize me in your fire baptize me in your fire I'm very careful how I pray that prayer because I know what I'm asking asking for don't let go of the wrestle until you are changed and transformed by the glory of the Lord his name was changed from Yaakov Jacob which means deceiver and surplanter to Israel which means loosely translated father of nations okay so don't let go it's fueled by genuine encounter number three is intimacy over productivity intimacy over productivity Remember what I said, we've talked about this a lot this weekend, so I'm not going to go over it, but the oil of intimacy of Matthew 25. See, the oil of intimacy is what is described in the, in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. The oil of intimacy is also what is described in the parable that we often interpret as stewardship, the parable of the talents. How many have interpreted that as stewardship? Not a bad interpretation. That's certainly one application. But I saw something in that that directly deals with the oil of intimacy is that the, the wicked servant says, I knew that you were harsh and cruel. Gathering where you haven't scattered and reaping where you haven't planted seed. I knew you were a hard man. I knew, I knew, I knew, but really he didn't know the master at all. There was no intimacy. There was no knowing. In the first parable, Jesus says to the foolish virgins, depart from me, you who practice wickedness. I never knew you. There's no intimacy. The second parable, we think of it as stewardship. It's not only stewardship. I, you didn't know the master. I knew you to be a hard man. He maligned the character of the father. What was the issue even in Genesis 1 in the garden with the snake? It was the snake tried to malign the character of 
of the Father. For the Lord knows that you will be like unto him when you eat of the fruit. No, he maligned the character and nature of the Father who only wishes good all the time for his children. And so there was no oil of intimacy. When we focus on productivity, when we focus on even good things, good things like I'm serving so much in the church. Look how much I'm serving. Look how much I'm doing. Look how much I'm giving. Look how much I'm tithing. Look how much I'm doing all of these things. If you don't have intimacy, it's dead works. It's dead religion. I used to tell my people when I was pastoring, keep your money and love the Lord Jesus. I don't need your money. We don't need money. Ask Mark. Mark isn't, you know, we're not sowing in because Mark needs the money. Right? We're not sowing in because if we don't give an offering, Mark's not going to go. He's going to go even if he has to pay from his own finances. Ask a real deal missionary. That's how they do it. That's how I do it. You know, I often, you know, lose on these mission trips. I have to sow my own finances. I have to sow my own money. It's a joy and a privilege and an honor. So you're not sowing because of a need. You're sowing seed because it has eternal weight and value for your life and for the kingdom. See, we've got to get this thing right. So when we value productivity and works over intimacy, we're out of alignment. We're out of alignment. Number four is the supremacy of Christ, the mindset of the supremacy of Christ. We talked about that at length yesterday. Please get the teaching from yesterday. I don't have time to go over all of that. That's Colossians 1 and Ephesians 6 juxtaposed, and we looked at the celestial hierarchy, and we saw that the top two tiers, thrones and dominions, never were seated to the end. Enemy. But the Lord himself retains those highest celestial hierarchy positions. Thrones and dominions belong to the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 says we wrestle with powers, principalities, authorities. Those are a lower rank as described in Colossians 1. It's fascinating when you hear it. And when we war, we war from the first heaven. We war from the top place, from the throne of God, where the Bible says we are where? We are seated with Jesus in heavenly places. So when you war, you're on the earth, but you're warring from the highest place, which has authority over the kingdom of the enemy. So the supremacy of Christ. And number five is keeping the edge, not finding the comfort zone. Keeping the edge, not finding the comfort zone. Okay, so this is our dominion mandate, and I'm, I'm really going to try to get through that. Can I have five minutes? Just raise your hand if I can have five minutes. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50. Okay, good. We're good. We're good. No, I'm joking. That's also a Bishop Stearns joke. <laughs> but I want to release this to you just as expeditiously as I can. Are you hungry for the word? Is that all right? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Apostle Judy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so keeping the edge, not finding the comfort zone. How many know it's easier to stay in comfort? It's easier to stay in comfort. It's easier, easier for me to lie in bed and eat bonbons than get on the treadmill. How many know what I'm saying? It's, it's easier for me to stuff my face, you know, than to fast and pray. It's easier to do those things, to find the comfort zone. And there are times of feasting, but man, we've been feasting and playing a lot when God said you need to be fasting and praying. It's a season where we need to be fasting and praying, okay? And so God has called us to this. So in this dominion mandate, we are going to have to choose to get out of our comfort zone with this mindset that I'm about to equip you with, something that probably you've already heard, but I want to give it to you again because I really feel it's vital for this time we live in in the earth, okay? And so Esther 4 and 14 says this, for if you remain silent at this time, and this is a word to the body of Christ, this is a word about lifting our voices. This is a word to the watchmen. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Who knows that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. As this, Do you know, friends, who you are? Do you know who you are? Some of us, we look in the mirror and we hate what we see. We come to church, we put on the face. How are you, brother? I'm good, bless God. <laughs> I'm great, you know. Look, I got my offering right here. You got yours, you know. You're going to hear the sermon. I'm ready. Come on. Like, 
we come and we play the games. And that's not a criticism. It's just reality. I've played the games. I've had seasons of my life where I was playing the games. I was sharing with Apostle Judy and Apostle John last night, 19 years old, two years already in full-time ministry, dying inside. And the Lord needed to come and encounter me in a real way. We play these games because we're, we're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of abandonment. We're afraid of intimacy, right? Into me, see. You've heard that before, I'm sure. We're afraid of those things. And so we put on the mask. We put on the face. We choose religious pretense over authenticity and honesty. And God is looking for a people who will choose authenticity and honesty over religious pretense, intimacy over productivity, intimacy over looking like we've got everything together. Yes. See, I don't, you know, when I trust somebody, when I truly trust somebody, if, if somebody says to me, you're family to me, that means I can go to their house and I can take my shoes off and I can sit in their chair, right? And I can even take a nap. If I need to, I can watch the football game, right? You know, I don't have to beg them to feed me, right? I don't have to say, hey, can I have a glass of water? Would that be okay, right? If you're family, you're family. My daughters don't ask my permission to open up my refrigerator and get something to eat or get a snack or whatever. They don't ask my permission. Hey, can I lay in that bed over there? Well, sweetie, it's your bed, you know? They don't ask because they are family to me. We say that we're a family. We say we're the family of God, you know, and I understand boundaries and healthy, healthy boundaries and all of that, right? Don't show up at each other's house in your pajamas, you know, and expect somebody to, to you know, put you in their, their master suite of their home with unannounced, okay? I'm not talking about being rude, but I am talking about if we are family, we need to act like family, you know what I'm saying? If it's real, it needs to be real. If it's not real, what are we doing? What, what are we wasting our time playing games? I don't have time for games. You don't have time for games. The hour is later than we realize. It's actually much later than we realize. And so who knows that you have come to, to your position for such a time as this. We are the family of God. We are royalty. You don't need to wear the masks. You don't need to wear the pretense. You are royalty. You are a, a daughter and a son of the king. You have been authorized and deputized. You've been given dunamis, which is explosive power. You've been given exousia, which is the authority. You wear the badge. Think of it like wearing the badge, like a police officer. You are commissioned by the Lord. And so this is the heart of the responsibility of the watchman that the Lord has given us in this time in the earth that we can transform our world. Remember at the beginning, that was my word to you. You can transform your world, okay? And let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us, I love that it's plural. <laughs> I love that it's plural. Let us make man in our image after our likeness to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over all the livestock and over the earth itself and every creature that crawls upon it. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, uniquely, beautifully, Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, and this is the crux of our talk today. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that crawls upon the earth. Then God said, behold, I've given you every seed bearing plant on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. They will be yours for food and to every beast of the earth and every bird of the air and every creature that crawls upon the earth, everything that has the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And God looked upon all that he had made and indeed it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day now this first word I want to look at is the word image let us make man in our image in our image in our likeness okay and I've got my notes a little bit out of order so let me just catch up here and put them where I need to to have them but this word image is extremely important for our mindset as we delve into this because this is who you are in God let us make man in our image. Got to find it. And I don't have it, okay? But 
I'll just tell you, it's the word salem. I know it off the top of my head. It's the word salem in the Hebrew. And salem means this. It means an exact replication so close that it's almost like the original. An exact replication so close that it's almost like the original. See, you and I, we're not Father God, right? We're not God omnipotent. We are created in his image. Another word that this, another thing that this word means is it's like a phantom. How many know what I'm talking about like a phantom? You see something, the phantom of the opera. You all know that movie. You see something, it passes by and you're like, whoa, that must be, you know, the real thing. It's so close to the real thing that it is, is, it is his exact replica in many, many ways. And so you are the image bearer of the Lord. You are the image bearer when you go to Wawa. You are the image bearer when you go to the grocery store. You are the image bearer as you set foot upon the nations. You are the image bearer of the Lord. You are created in his salem, his image. You are an exact replica of the Lord, but a little lower. That's the connotation in the Hebrew. And that's what the Bible says. He made him a little lower than the angels. He crowned them with goodness. He crowned them with honor, with dignity. You are the image bearer of the Lord. So never look in the mirror again and think that you're junk and you're nothing and you don't have anything to offer see that's not true that's not the word of the Lord over your life the word of the Lord over your life is that you are an image bearer of the Lord and you are royalty in the kingdom a salem an image bearer a likeness the word of the Lord to you today is you are created in the likeness of God can you say amen the next word I want to look at here is the word blessed. This is the word in the Hebrew, barak, barak, and it means this, and we often miss this. It says, then God blessed them and said to them what he said to them, which we'll get into in a minute, but he blessed them. This word blessed is the word barak. Of the seven Hebrew words for praise, this is one of the words for praise. It's also one of the words for bless and one of the words for glory, and it means this. It means to kneel and to bless, to kneel and to bless. When God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, how much bigger than them was he? How much taller than them was he? You know, let your imagination go for a minute. Did he kneel down and bless them like a father? Like Mark kneels down and blesses his four-year-old son, or like I kneel down and I bless my four-year-old also, Sophia, who also asked me for gummies before I came back from this trip? Did he kneel down? Did he bless them? But see, I want us to see this because as God kneeled, he knelt and blessed. In that blessing was all the power of the dominion mandate. In that blessing was all the force of the spirit of God where he empowered them. He endued them with the life inside of them to carry out the dominion mandate. As the rabbis would say, to tikkun olam, to, re to realize the restoration of all things. We talked about Thursday night how the word was in Genesis 1 1 and 1 2 now in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was was without form and you know without form and void and darkness was on the surface of the deep the word was is a poor translation it's the word haya and it means to fall out to become like a wasteland and a desolation and so in the midst of what had become like a wasteland and a desolation, we don't understand what happened, but between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, it's very clear from the Hebrew and from the scripture, something happened where the earth became, it fell out, it came to pass that it was void like a wasteland and like a destruction. There's another, there's another uh, connotation even of chaos in that. And so in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that destruction, in the midst of what had become like a wasteland what did God do he planted a garden in Eden what did God do he said I'm going to put life in the midst of this desolation I'm going to put life in the midst of this chaos I'm going to put life and beauty in the midst of this wasteland and I am going to bless them and empower them with everything they need to make this entire wasteland this earth like the garden of Eden isn't that incredible when you think of that? And that blessing, that force, that power was imparted as God knelt and blessed. I like to believe like a father embracing his children. 
Did he embrace them? Did he kneel down and embrace them? And again, this isn't something I can theologically prove, but it's pretty close to the meaning of the Hebrews. So, you know, come on, let's go with it. Kneel down and bless. And he is a father. He's the father of glory. Did he whisper it in their ear? Did he shout it? Did he boom it? Did he impart it into them? Did they just know what he was saying because of the depth of the connection between the Lord and them? But he blessed them. And in that blessing was all the power of what, what we call the dominion mandate. Say the dominion mandate mandate so in this dominion mandate how we are to change our world how we are to impose the kingdom upon every place that we don't see heaven represented Jesus taught his disciples when you pray our father who's in heaven hallowed be your name kingdom come now will of God be done now read it in the Greek don't read it in the English read it in the Greek kingdom come now will of God be done now it's an emphatic command in the Greek it's very different than the English kingdom come now will be done now it's an imposition of heaven upon the earth a forceful imposition of heaven upon the earth earth doesn't have a choice because of this power that Jesus is describing heaven be on earth now so wherever you don't see heaven on the earth and all you've got to do to not see heaven upon the earth is drive down the street that's all you got to do anywhere you don't see heaven upon the earth this dominion mandate has empowered you to do that and I say this dominion mandate because what was lost from Genesis 128 because we know the rest of the story they fell there was curse the earth itself was cursed the man was cursed the woman was cursed the serpent was cursed and so curse came into the earth that power came into the earth but through the second Adam in Matthew 28 what was lost in Genesis 128 was restored through the second Adam Jesus Christ so we have the power back. The curse has been broken. And we have the power back to fulfill everything in this dominion mandate. Can you say amen? So it says he blessed them. And he said be fruitful. Now this word is para in the Hebrew. Para. It, it means to bear fruit, to be fruitful, to become fruitful. It also means though to flourish. To flourish. To grow. To increase. To, to literally have this power inside of you that you never stay stagnant. You never stay stagnant. You never plateau in the kingdom. The Bible says we go from grace to grace, right? Say it with me. From strength to strength. From faith to faith. From glory to glory. We are never to be stagnant. Think of water how water flows, right? When water is flowing and water is moving, it's healthy water. But when you look at a pool or a pond or even a puddle that is stagnant water, don't drink that water, don't touch that water, that's not healthy water because it's not moving. A pond that is not moving, a pond that is not circulating, the water's st stagnant and it's there, it becomes green, full of algae, full of disease, full of bacteria. And that is you and me when we don't move with Holy Spirit. The Bible says out of our belly would flow rivers of living water. If you don't move that that water Jesus said the light within you can become darkness and when that light within you becomes darkness how great is that darkness you got to move in the spirit you got to move that living water because when it's stagnant what was once supposed to bring life and health and vitality and all of that healing now brings disease and bacteria the light within you becoming darkness we need to move and it's part of even the original dominion mandate to fill to be fruitful means that we are moving we are growing we are increasing we are never stagnant so that's the first thing the second thing is to multiply and this is the word rabah to multiply it means to become much many or great but it means this the infinite absolute the infinite absolute what does that look like it looks like the Greek uh, sign for infinity was the letter eight right or the number eight because if I trace my hand like this I finished but now I'm starting again and I have finished but now I'm starting again and I have finished but now I'm starting again it's like lamb chop the song that never ends right this is the song that doesn't end right my kids my kids saw that the other day <laughs> and started singing it and I thought oh no how did they see that I've got to hide right because they just loved it you know they just went on and on and on and on how many know the song that doesn't end right lamb chops play along you watched it when you were a kid in the 80s like I did right 
and it never ends, but that's infinity. But so when God said you can multiply, it's the infinite absolute. Find me the end of, of numbers. Can you find me the end of numbers? No, they keep going on and on and on. And I want to demonstrate this, right? Let's count by twos, right? Count with me. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Okay, stop. Now that's increasing and that's good. It's good to increase. The Bible even talks about that in our finances. It says that the one who grows money little by little succeeds and becomes prosperous. So there is nothing wrong with increasing. There's nothing wrong with growing. That's really, really good. And there are seasons of your life when you are going to grow and increase incrementally like that. But then the principle of multiplication comes into effect. And the principle of multiplication, which is what this word means and what God blessed us with in the original dominion mandate, not only to grow and to spread out and to increase, but not only that, but to multiply. Now let's try it again. Two times two is four, right? And then four times four is 16. And let's double that. 32, 64, right? 128, 256, 512, 1024, 2048. I just got over 2,000 quicker by multiplying, then you and I counting together by twos, growing incrementally, we're able to get even to 14. Do you see that principle? That is what God is trying to say to us in this dominion mandate blessing. I have given you the power to multiply. See, that's why you can give a dollar and it's your last dollar in the offering. It's like the widow's might. It's all you got. You don't have anything else, but you give it out of obedience. And before you leave this place, somebody slips you a Benjamin. Somebody slips you a $100 bill you just increased by a hundred time the parable came true in your life that 30 60 a hundred fold you just got a hundred fold increase on that dollar that you sowed see that's the principle of multiplication and in the kingdom the principle of multiplication is working in your life if you will believe it and receive it see sometimes we've got all these blessings we've got all this equipment we've got all these tools we've got all these weapons from the Lord they're at our side they're in the word they're accessible by faith but we don't pick them up we don't yield them and wield them see it's like the the Israelites when they were applying the blood to the doorposts right so the angel of death would pass over the blood was went into a basin but that blood in the basin they had to take and actually historically it was hyssop which is really cool when you think about that Psalm 51 cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean wash me and I'll be whiter than snow the washing of the blood of Jesus which that lamb being slain and the angel of death passing over was a sign of but they took the hyssop and they would dip it in the bowl and they would put that on the doorpost it had to be applied right and that's how the kingdom is in our lives you have to apply the principles of the kingdom how many know what I'm saying apply the principles of faith apply this and so when you apply in faith this principle of multiplication it's not just true for giving it's true for faith it's true for healing it's true for deliverance it's true for restoration it's true for relationships being restored it is true in your life the Bible says the man Abraham grew and became prosperous until he became very prosperous the word there is parats which is our word for breakthrough that's the will of God for you that you would break through and multiply in Jesus name so we can multiply with God's infinite absolute I love that his infinite absolute his very nature of who he is and then we are to fill we are to fill and that is the word malay malay which means to fill to be full but it also means this it means to arm like arming an army it means to become complete it means to drench or saturate. It means to ordain. It means to satisfy. It even means there's the connotation in the Hebrew like the emptiness of space. Isn't that amazing? Where the universe itself, we look at the universe itself and it is full of the stars and heavenly hosts. So God said fill. In other words, take over everything. Fill everything, multiply everywhere you go, grow everywhere you go, move, spread out, increase, advance. 
The Bible says in Joshua, everywhere you place your foot that God has given you the territory. Did that promise just come to Joshua and the Israelites? No, that promise is to you and to me. When you go to work, you put your foot on that concrete. You go, God has given me this territory. God has given me this place. You set foot in this parking lot. You set foot in this strip mall here. And you say, God has given me everywhere that I place my foot. God has given me the dominion. There is no place where the enemy has dominion. He has power still, as we talked about this weekend. Don't underestimate the devil. Don't think that he's some little lamb. He's not a little lamb. He's a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. He has power, but he has no more authority. The authority was stripped from him. The authority was taken away from him. He can roar. He can bite. He can harass. He can try to mess up your life, but you have authority over him. And the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist him, and he has no teeth to sink into you. And so you are called to fill everywhere that the Lord calls you. If it's your school, fill your school with the glory of God. If it's a college, fill that college. If it's a workplace, fill it. If it's a, an airport, an airplane, a car, whatever it is, apply this principle everywhere you go. I'm telling you, it will change your life. You will wake up in the morning, and when your feet hit the ground, you will be aware of new marching orders that the Lord has given you. You will be aware that your life is not void of purpose purpose because some of you you feel like your life is void of purpose you know I don't have a microphone I'm not a preacher I'm not a minister so I don't have any purpose hogwash hogwash we have all been given the ministry of reconciliation we are all ministers in the anointing we are all ministers in the body of Christ and you have a purpose and this dominion mandate today I felt the Lord meant to arm your mindset to arm you with a mindset of breakthrough to arm you with a mindset of victory to arm you with a mindset of increase and enlargement and expansion because it's the will of God for you Hallelujah. So he said, fill. The other thing he said is subdue. Subdue, and that's the word kabosh. <laughs> kabosh. How many parents growing up said, I put the kabosh on that. You're not doing that, you know? Kabosh. No, it's not happening. You want to go out, party with your friends? Kabosh. No, you're not doing it. Right? So that's how you can remember that. But kabosh, it means to subdue or bring into bondage. Remember we talked about the first night. The wrestling match, Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not. What that word wrestle, pele, actually means in the Greek, it's a mortal combat that you are engaged in, a wrestling match where the, the goal is to put your enemy prostrate flat on their back and actually put your hand on their neck. That's the connotation. That's when it says we wrestle not with flesh and blood. We need to understand that because several, several of you weren't at the conference. That's what that means. We are in a wrestling match with forces of darkness that want to put you flat on your back and put their hand of wickedness on your neck and bring you into subjection. But according to Genesis 1 and 28, when God blessed his children, which includes you, made in his image, an image bearer of God, beautifully, wonderfully, amazing uniquely created you have the authority to not be overcome by evil but to overcome evil with good and to put your hand on the neck of the enemy and bring them into subjection there is nothing that can rule over you in fact the Bible even says sin itself no longer has dominion over you sin itself no longer can rule over you you're dealing with a sin in your body you're dealing with a temptation you're dealing with smoking you're dealing with lust you're dealing with alcohol addiction whatever it is believe Believe today that that enemy no longer has to rule over your life. Believe today that you can bring that power into subjection. You can lay it out flat on its back and put your hand on its neck and say, you obey me. Not the other way around. It was for freedom Christ has set us free. 
not to be burdened again with a yoke of bondage. And it's in Genesis 1.20. It's in the first 28 verses of the Bible. It's all there for us. I don't even have time to go into how in the first verse of Genesis, Jesus himself is in the first verse of Genesis in the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew writing, which is not only numeric, which is not only, you know, uh, pictorial, but it's also a, it's a letter, a number, and a picture. And Jesus is there, Bereshit bara, you know, in the first word of the Hebrew of Genesis. I don't even have to go time to go into that, but it's amazing. All of it is here, and all of it is for us. What are you waiting for? <laughs> what are we waiting for? Why do we live below the level that Scripture says we can live? Why do we live below the standard of the Word of God? Why do I live that way? Why do you live that way? What are we waiting for? See, earth itself is crying out, according to Romans chapter 8. It is crying out to be delivered from its bondage to decay. And do you know what it's waiting for? Sons. Sons. And men and women in this room, let me tell you this, we're all sons through faith in Christ Jesus. And men and women in this room, let me tell you this, we're all the bride of Christ that Jesus is coming to take away. It's not a gender confusion issue. It's not an identity issue. It's a position of favor and authority. A position of favor and authority. I'll tell you, my bride, my Tara, has access to things in me and money and resources and favor. There's nothing I wouldn't do for that woman. You ask me to do that? You ask me for $1,000? Oh, I don't feel led to do that, right? My wife, sure, you know, absolutely, whatever you need, because I trust her, and she has favor with me. She has favor with me that no one else on this earth has. My wife is unique in her position of favor with me. You are unique in your position of favor with God, the Lord of all the universe, Amazing, and you are unique in your position of authority. We are inheritors through faith in Christ Jesus as sons of God. Okay, so we can put the kabosh on the enemy. I think you'll like that. And the last word here is dominion. Say dominion. dominion. And it's the word rada. I got through this as quick as I could, guys. So this is the word rada, and it means to have dominion, to rule, to dominate, to prevail against and to make to crumble off. That's a very interesting connotation in the Hebrew. In other words, it's like when a cliff decays. You have dominion over the earth. You have dominion over everything that has been created. The Bible says the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over everything that creeps upon the earth. God has given you dominion. He has given you dominion. And we don't dominate, and I want to be clear about this, as the enemy dominates. The enemy tries to dominate through the power of the occult, which I said the Thursday night, it's infiltrate, manipulate, intimidate, and dominate or control. Those are the hallmarks of the occult. Our domination is a liberation. Our domination is, is proclaiming to the world the good news that you are liberated from your bondage to decay. You are liberated from the curse. There is a woman in my church even, she believed this so much she, but she took the word of God where it says that Jesus Christ has delivered us from the curse. So literally, she said, I don't have to have pain in childbirth. I don't have to have it. That was a part of the curse to Adam and Eve. Jesus has set me free from the curse. Three, ch four children, four children, no pain. No pain. Because she believed and received. It's all there waiting for us. It's all there waiting for us. And men, I want to speak this to you. The curse to Adam was not that he would work. The curse to Adam, and curse is not a work. Some of you men, you look at your job as a curse. It's not a curse. The curse to Adam was not that he would work. The curse to Adam is that he would work and he would toil. And that through toil, he would bring forth the fruit of the earth. So work is not the curse. Toil is the curse, and they are very different things. I want to set you free from that toil, some of you men today, and some of you women that work high-powered jobs, high-stress, high-pressured jobs. I set you free from the power of toil. Men and women of God, you do not have to toil in your work. The curse is broken through the power of Jesus Christ. As we close, let's look at this, 1 Corinthians 15. 
because this is the power. The Bible says the first Adam was a living being. The second Adam, a life-giving spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, so it shall be with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual, however, was not first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earth man so also are those who are of the earth and as is the heavenly man so also are those who are of heaven and just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man so also shall we bear the likeness of the heavenly man what was lost to humanity in genesis 128 jesus the heavenly man jesus the second adam did in matthew 28 when he released the dominion mandate to the earth to the disciples when he said go and transform your world go and transform your world the dominion mandate is restored the curse is broken I put my foot on the neck of the enemy I conquered death hell and the grave I rose from the dead as the anastasis and the zoe the resurrection and the life I am the one that got up again they put me in the ground they put me in the grave but I got up again Buddha never got up again Muhammad never got up again Krishna never Ever got up again no occult leader ever got up again no cult leader ever got up again but the Lord Jesus Christ got up again and he broke the power of death hell and the grave for you and for me for eternity and he has given us the keys of the kingdom and he has restored the dominion mandate to you and to me and I want to end with this do you know what fuels the dominion mandate what fuels how we are going to stand in Matthew 24 shaking. How we are going to tikkun olam. Work with the Lord. Partner with the Lord. For the restoration of all things. When God calls forth his sons, his huyas, his mature ones upon the earth. And we set the earth free of its bondage from decay. And we see the restoration of the, the kingdom of God on earth as, in, as it is in heaven. What fuels that dominion mandate, friends, is the oil of intimacy. What fuels, it's the gasoline in the tank of your car that pushes you down the road of glory as you fulfill the dominion mandate. But if you fulfill this dominion mandate, if you walk out of here with this swagger and this authority and say, everywhere I put my foot, I've got the authority, I've got the dominion. Yes, it's true, but if you do it without love, you're a clanging gong or a sounding cymbal. And that's how some of the world perceives us. They perceive our good theology and our good mindsets and our good principles and all of this, but it's without love. And so if we do this, which is true, I preached my guts out for 45 minutes about this. It's true, but if we do it without love, we are missing the entire point. And I believe God wants to fill us with fresh oil today. I believe he already did. We've already had one drink, but I believe the Lord wants to give us another drink. And I want to invite you to this altar. 